some of that stress from the candidate and let him focus on one or two things. Right. They forced him to fight off every every area. Let me ask you this, Daniel. I want others to weigh in on this too. Where were the other Republican voices uh, pulling for Mr. Ron Ketty this cycle? I didn't, you know, think about the people he beat in the primary. Where were all those folks and others? Yeah, I mean, Rebecca Dow was doing stuff for him. I know sure. that. I saw her on some things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, but again, I think that's the job of the party chair and the party, right? The right. party chair and the party is the one who's supposed to say, go fight, then bring everybody back together in the general election and say, let's focus on what the end goal is. And I just feel like, you know, we, you know, it, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I think, uh, mm -hmm. once again, I think the party has failed uh, for uh, Mark Ronchetti and for the other candidates up and down the ballot. Mm -hmm. Senator Feldman, let me start with you on this. Uh, you heard me ask Dan about this idea of where Republicans were, you know, others, the big names for him, for Mr. Ron Ketty. We concentrate on, on uh, Governor Lujan Grisham as well. In your sense of watching a lot of political races, you've watched a lot of gubernatorial races, certainly as well. How did you think she did going into this? Any missteps, anything that left her vulnerable, anything that made her especially strong that Mr. Ron Ketty couldn't get near? What was your sense of how she ran her campaign? Well, she is an incumbent, mm -hmm. and um, I think she ran a very good campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, there really wasn't much much that she left on the table there for him. Uh, of course, he tried to pick up things that happened, uh, you know, years ago, uh, and I think all of the negative campaigning that was done against her, mm -hmm. I think, kind of played to her favor, really, mm -hmm. because. Um, it just didn't, there was so much of it, and there was so much negative campaigning, money thrown around. Um, I think now the latest thing was that altogether they spent a f about $40 million wow. on the governor's race when you count in all the uh, independent expenditures. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not to say that the Democrats are without sin either, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I think that Michelle was very careful. She had an opportunity to run on her strengths, her experience and her accomplishments, her, the, the um, salary increases for teachers, the scholarships for college students, the uh, rebates for families, mm -hmm. um, the, um, the lower unemployment rate in New Mexico than we've had for quite a while, although it doesn't stack up great nationally. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, we've been down so long, it looks like up right. to us, <laughs> you know. Yep. So, um, and the environmental measures that she did, um, she, um, she got a chance to showcase them. Right. And he really had no answer for that. Right. Martha Burke, let me get you to dovetail on this. Mr. Ron Ketty clearly needed to make inroads with women if he was going to have a chance here. And the abortion issue, was that the one thing that stopped him cold? Or Senator Feldman's long list of accomplishments there from, from the governor, all those could be classified as quote-unquote female issues if you really, really want to parse them. How do you think he did out there in the campaign show when it came to attracting women? <laughs> I think it was a disaster. Uh, he was totally anti-choice, uh, and then he got the nomination and he tried to walk it back. Women, women know better than mm -hmm. that. Gee, my mm -hmm. gosh, you know. And Didi is right. Uh, he was outspent three to one by outside groups, but I don't think that made the difference. I think, well, first of all, we need to remember that women can control any election. Women are the majority of voters, mm -hmm. they're the majority of registrants, and they're the majority that show up at the polls. And when there is a hot button issue like abortion, even if they don't agree with the candidate 100% on some other things, mm -hmm. I think they're gonna pull that lever for the person that is in favor of women con having mm -hmm. control of their own lives. Mm -hmm. And Ron Ketty just made an ass out of himself when he tried to walk it back and say, well, I'm really anti-abortion, but I'm really not. And hey, who's he kidding? Yep. Uh, Senator Snyder, uh, again, let's touch on this as well. What could Mr. Ron, again, we're not making a prediction here. I mean, all the votes are not counted. I'm sure you, you respect that out of, out of anybody. But is there anything in your mind Mr. Ron Ketty could have done differently looking back now from Election Day specifically to get uh, more women into his corner here? 
no, what I find interesting, and I've been watching, obviously, since early or late afternoon, the national uh, direction, and even the BBC is saying that uh, the number one, uh, and they are exit polling, the number one issue is with everybody across the country in the United States is the economy. Right. Abortion came in a, a much lower second. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that people who truly are pro-choice, many of them will not vote or have to buy, uh, hold their nose to vote for candidates who are pro-choice in New Mexico right. because our, our laws and non-laws are so liberal. When you talk to anyone about being allowed to go to uh, late-term abortion or even at birth, all of my friends who are pro-choice, they draw the line there. That right. is not acceptable to mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that Mark could have done more on playing on that than he did. Mm -hmm. But the economy is that all the wonderful things that Dee Dee listed, uh, the only one that address, address, uh, addresses the economy was the rebate. Uh. Nothing else touched and improved. And when you go to the grocery store and you, or you have to go to the gas station and it's a hundred dollars right. to fill just a regular SUV, mm -hmm. not a biggie, just a regular, and you have and you're still trying to go to the grocery store and buy food for your family, let me tell you that's more important. And only in New Mexico, or at least one of the few states is New Mexico that will disregard those kinds of things and still use abortion as the the major issue. Mm -hmm. Dan, no, I, go ahead, please. I didn't go see ahead. either candidate yeah. using abortion as a major issue. I saw Ron Kennedy trying to cut and, and paste his No, uh, his he prior, said he, uh, no, no, no. The he governor, said, the governor that, said that he, the whole election from the governor was it's about choice. The entire election from Governor said. Michelle Augustine was it's about choice, yeah. which was the right move for her to make. Where This is where I think... The disaster was from the Republican Party. The Re Diane is right. The senator is right. The Republican Party, after the primary, should have made the question in New Mexico not about choice and 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 uh, pro life and pro choice. It should have been the conversation should have been about partial birth abortion, late term abortion, taxpayer funded abortion. Mm -hmm. Because in every poll across the country right now, if you go back 15 years and the the question is just pro choice or pro life. The pro-life people weren't winning. Now, no, today, we you're not. seeing across I, I the board. Now, now they across were not. The, Look at Kansas. My I God. just said they were not winning back then. Disaster. Let me finish my thought. Today, well, today, when you put, franchise. when you poll, when you but poll Kansas. today and put the uh, feasibility conversation in at 15 weeks and talk about uh, being for rape, incest, life of the mother, most people, an overwhelming number of people, come back and say that is a that is a common sense approach. And the the problem is is that the governor did a phenomenal job about making the election about pro life, pro choice, right. and the party should have taken that away from Mark Ronchetti and did the heavy lifting to say this is a referendum on partial birth abortion, late term abortion, all the things out there. I think that would have helped Mark. They Ronchetti. can't take it away from Ronchetti because that's not where they stand, Dan. They're against it's, abortion, and the next thing to go will be birth control. Let's that's, I, I mean, oh, oh, you, that's I, I'm glad you got the it. talking points from the that's Democrat that's Party, but that's not, that's not what's happening. It's not what the bill in Texas says. It's not what anything else is happening. But it it's okay if you, no, keep, if you, if you say it enough times, it'll become true, I believe. Let me, let me ask you this, guys. By the way, just a quick update here on the governor's race as we're talking about it. 318,000, almost, almost 319,000 votes are in. The governor's showing it at 57%. Mr. Ron Kelly at 41%. Still early. Still early, but just to get everybody updated there. Um, let's talk about CD1, if we could, real quick. We, I guess we just got a couple of minutes to kind of get around the horn here. Um, Senator Feldman, I, I, you know, the new district lines, is there any, let's, let's start with CD1 here. Uh, district lines have any d demonstrable effect in your mind for Democrat Melanie Stansbury? Single digit lead? How, did they contribute to what we're seeing tonight? Well, it's a little more competitive. Okay. I think that we knew that, uh, that um, in order to make CD2 
more competitive and give a few more points to the Democrats. They took a few points out of both CD1 and CD3. Okay. So, um, yet I think Melanie's in good shape. I think Melanie's going to to win that seat, and um, it's a tribute, I think, to her hard work and uh, the fact that she has established a reputation in a short time as a um, expert on water and uh, climate issues. Mm-hmm. So um, I think she's, uh, you know, you never know what's going to happen to those house seats up in up in the Heights That's now right. because you know that used to be Republican territory. Melanie was the one that really converted it to a democratic area. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, now that it's not a presidential year, um, I think those House members are more at risk. Mm -hmm. Um, Let me go to Senator, let me go to Senator Snyder on this one for CD2. We're showing Gabe Vasquez early numbers here with 58% to Yvette Harrell's 42%. Uh, on the Secretary of State site, it's again, we're not we're not terribly far down the road here, just over 81,000 votes totaled. To I'm curious to your sense of how Ms. Harrell is not further ahead of Gabe Vasquez in this district. What, what's your sense of why this is so close? Because southeastern New Mexico is not in CD2. It's now in CD1 right. or in CD3. And when you take and separate out a, a area of common interest, you know, you know it's going to have an impact. And I think that very clearly is showing. And I just go back to, and I've thought about this for every day for days now, mm-hmm. and particularly about the CD races, is uh, the speaker told us two years ago that that was that he now had control. And every district was going to have a Democrat in it. He said that in public on the air. And he was right. Mm -hmm. He made it come out that way. Yes, Didi's right. They did take a few percentage counties or percentage points from CD3, uh, the Democrats, and CD1. But when you consider CD3 is overwhelmingly Democratic, then a couple of votes here, um, percentage points here and there, mm-hmm. didn't make a big difference. In southeastern New Mexico, they took and divided out an area of common interest and gave it to an area that is not. There is nothing, nothing in common between southeastern New Mexico, Hobbs, at the Roswell, et cetera, and Albuquerque. Mm-hmm. They don't have common issues. Dan, so, uh, let me ask Dan. It, it, a, a district is a district, and you got to show up. What? Yeah, I mean, did Miss Harold do enough yeah. here in the new part of the district, Dan Foley, or did Mr. Gabe? Did Gabe do better? I mean, I'm trying to get a no, his sense. I, of, I mean, I, those are. That's a great question, and and the senator's right. Diane's right. I mean, you know, in the past, the state was sort of broken up where. You know, ever since your former boss was the last real Republican to have that seat, you know, you had CD3, which was all Democrat, CD2, which was all Republican, CD1 was always kind of the toss up. And that's kind of the way it was. And when you go down there and you carve up Roswell, Carlsbad, Hobbs, Artesia, and you divide them into two or three districts, it really adds, especially with the growth and the movement blue that Don Yana County has had, Mm -hmm. it really weakens CD2. Um, I'm not sure what she could have done to come up to the South Valley. Right. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, it's clear that Gabe Vasquez is going to do really well in Las Cruces. I mean, he's from there, city councilor down there. Yep. People know him. Um, but, you know, you've re- they really took Yvette Harrell's base from her, which is Chavez, Eddie, those places, and really kind of chopped it up. But again, you know, to the senator's point, this is the thing people in New Mexico have to wake up to. Elections have consequences. If you're in charge, you draw the districts. I mean, it's funny. We're, we're saying the same thing in New Mexico that the Democrats are saying in Texas, right? It's the Good it's point. the process the way it is, right? Yeah. It's the way the process is done up. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I think Yvette's going to come through this. I do think her part of Otero County, Chavez County, Eddy County, I do think they're going to come out strong oil and gas. I do think they know what's at stake. Mm-hmm. Senator Feldman, let's go up north. Uh, CD3, of course, uh, Teresa Leger Fernandez. Uh, ran a good race. Boy, she spent a lot of money on some really interesting advertising, talking about who she was, where she's from, you know, really, you know, solidifying she is of her district. It seems to be paying off for her. What's your sense of it when you look at it? 
I think she ran the best TV commercials uh, of the of the whole uh, season. I'd have to agree. And yeah. uh, they really made you like her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they made you like her as a person uh, and made you feel like she was really working for her district, um, which she is. She really is working for her district. And you have to remember all that she did for the folks that were stricken by the terrible fire right. up there and how she fought. Uh, in Washington for benefits for them. Um, she's, uh, she's in, in good shape, I think. Uh, and uh, she was upset initially. Are you Pardon? Hold on, Dan, you're, you're, you need to be muted there, Daniel. No problem. Let me, let me jump to Martha here. Just got a couple of minutes on this segment left. Um, Ms. Ledger Fernandez, in your view, are we looking at a future superstar here? Meaning it's a fairly safe seat and second time around and she's clearly got something going on Capitol Hill. That's no small amount of money she pulled in for, for rescue after the fires uh, in her district. Is this the beginning of something as you see it? I think it is. I mm -hmm. think that she has a very bright future. But there's no question about that. Yeah. Uh, with a little bit of time I've got left, though, I got to get back to the, uh, the Vasquez uh, Please. event. Mm -hmm race uh we can talk about redistricting all we want to but we got to get to the fundamentals here and that is what they believe in yvette harrell is a hardliner against choice against women vasquez is uh, more liberal but he's not as liberal as they're pointing him out to be but he's certainly on the right side of that vote and remember women do control the elections mm -hmm. so we we'll talk about redistricting all you want but what did they stand for yeah it's going to be interesting Wednesday morning fodder. Well, maybe Thursday morning, but at some point it will be fodder uh, for all of us to talk about. Thank you all for joining us for this election night discussion for sure. Uh, don't miss our post-election coverage this Friday night at 7 o'clock on NMPBS Channel 5.1. We'll have more analysis from a new group of opinion panelists on the line. Now, we're far from done here tonight. I'll be back here at the desk in five minutes talking with New Mexico and Focus correspondents Antonia Gonzalez and Gwyneth Dolan live here in studio. We'll talk about their series of candidate conversations and what they learned in the races for governor, Congress, and Navajo Nation president. But first, a conversation between our senior producer, Lou DiVizio, and leaders from two groups working to promote a new initiative from the Carter Center to set up candidate principles for trusted elections. Here's Lou. We have Heather Ballas, she's the Vice President of Programs at the Election Reformers Network, and she's also the former Executive Director of New Mexico First. Danielle Gonzalez is the current Executive Director of New Mexico First. Uh, it's an organization that's meant to engage New Mexicans in policy, ideally pushing them towards democratic action. Thank you both for being here. The level of polarization is undeniably growing in nationally here in New Mexico. Are there philosophies that have changed within political parties or society as a whole that have contributed to this? Yeah, I think it's no question that our democracy is in crisis. And it's not just the democracy overall, but it's the fabric that holds us together as a society. And I think one key change that has happened over the last 10 to 15 years is in politics, there used to be incentives to work across the aisle. When New Mexico first was founded in 1986, it was founded by Senator Domenici and Senator Bingaman, a Republican and a Democrat, who had experience of working together and saw the true benefits of working together. Now we live in a society where if you're a Democrat who works with Republicans frequently or you're a Republican who works with Democrats frequently, you get called bad things. Mm -hmm. And it really makes me think about, there's this comic that I saw, I think it's a far side comic, and it's two dogs sitting at a bar and they're drinking a martini and one dog's <laughs> turning to the other and says, it's not enough that us dogs win, the cats have to lose too. And that really is how things are reflected in society today. And it's not just the partisan differences that I think are increased, it's just, it's hard for us as Americans, as New Mexicans to work across difference, to work across urban versus rural or age, but gender, race, there's just become so much divisiveness in our society overall, which has huge implications, not just for democracy and elections, but also education and healthcare and so many other important issues. I think the biggest drivers of the changes are um, social media and the rise of cable news. Um, as at least I, I would say those are very significant drivers of the type of um, polarization that Danielle is talking about. Those, both of those types of entities, whether for um, 
uh, easy ratings or multiple clicks tend to say that every issue is divided upon an extreme right and an extreme left, right? It's easy to book guests that take that approach, um, and it's easy to put the extremists um, on screen because they're the ones that are going to say the most outlandish things and the things that are most going to be quickest and easiest to go and forward. But the, in my view, the taking of any issue and, and boiling it down to an extreme right and an extreme left is unconscionably reductive. Now these candidate principles, can you describe exactly what you're asking candidates to do? They're sort of predicated on the notion that, uh, the same notion that we all probably got in seventh grade social studies, the one that says democracy is predicated on the consent of the governed, right? Consent of the governed means that we, as the, as the uh, people that are willing to be governed, say, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm on board. We're on board if we have confidence in our leaders and we have confidence in the process that, by which those leaders were selected. So there's um, a whole host of ways that we can strengthen those things. One of them the, uh, would be these candidate principles for trusted elections that do ask our um, candidates for public office to um, agree to five baseline principles for practical um, and ethical behavior as it comes to how they're running for office. And that includes being honest about the electoral process, um, that includes um, denouncing threats um, or acts of violence against their opponent or their opponent's family or election workers. Uh, that includes respecting people's right to vote with it free of intimidation. That includes ensuring that uh, poll workers themselves are, uh, that are representing candidates behave respectfully when they're doing that um, poll watching job. And lastly, and probably most importantly, is adhering to the rule of law. That means um, recognizing um, at the end of the day who won or lost the election. And that's not saying that if somebody who's running for office can't call for recounts and can't um, take concerns to the courts, um, but at the end of the day, once all of those legal contestations are decided, um, we're asking candidates to say, we'll follow the rule of law and, and accept the results as are ultimately decided either by election officials or the courts. Now, Danielle, is, are you aware that this is something that New Mexican voters wanted to see, to know that this is where their candidates are coming from? Yeah, which is fascinating and kind of counter to the whole conversation that we were just having. Uh, but yes, there's actually been polling about this. When you ask people, do you would you vote for candidates who would stand up for what's right, who would follow the honest processes, who would support the results of the election, people actually say yes, and it's pretty compelling. Um, and so we're really excited about that and excited to be one of the organizations here in New Mexico leading the Candidate Principles Project. Joining me live in studio now are two of our New Mexico One Focus correspondents who helped carry out our series of candidate conversations. Antonio Gonzalez and Gwyneth Dolan, great to see both of you. This is really kind of like old times sake sitting at the table. This is so good. <laughs> Thank you for your work this election season especially. Now Antonio, we start with you. You spoke with both candidates for Navajo Nation president. Fascinating interviews. If you miss them folks, you can peel back and see them even after the fact. They're actually quite interview, but inter interesting. But COVID-19 came up a lot in both interviews. I'm curious in your view, you know, the, we know the virus hit the Navajo Nation especially hard. and There were huge challenges. Let's start with the incumbent. How do you think the incumbent handled it and expressing how he handled the COVID-19 situation? So President Jonathan Nez, of course, has led the tribe through the pandemic. And like you said, COVID-19 has hit not only the Navajo Nation hard, but really hit Indian country hard, and especially uh, Navajo people. There are a lot of lost lives. Um, Nez had a lot of emergency mandates, including mask mandates, uh, closing the reservation. So there were a lot of really strict mandates that Navajo people um, had during the pandemic, and there are still some safety measures mm -hmm. in that are still going on today. Mm -hmm. And what uh, President Nez told us during the interviews is that he still wants to be cautious and that they learned a lot of lessons. And also with monkeypox, he was concerned about um, right. that and talking about some of the cases coming on to the Navajo Nation. Mm -hmm. So I think that from his perspective, what he told us is that he's still cautious. Mm -hmm. He's such a familiar name. Uh, he had a challenger, of course, a challenger. I love the interview you had. I, I learned so much. How do you think the challenger uh, came across in this whole situation? It's almost generational, it seems to me. <laughs> like I said, the, the, the incumbent is so well known. Was it a generational shift going on here, possibly, on, on, in this election? 
It's really interesting, uh, Dr. Boone Nigren, who is, uh, you know, he talked about growing up in his life and he didn't shy away from any of the many statistics that impact the Navajo Nation and tribes across the country when it comes to social issues. And um, he talked about growing up in poverty, talked about growing up with a single mother, mm -hmm. um, and also just um, having his mother having to deal with substance and abuse right. and, and passing away from substance abuse. And so, yes, he has a, a younger generation and um, he wants to fully reopen everything. Right. And he's he said as soon as he made his announcement for run for president in April, that that was the first thing he wanted to do was fully open uh, mm -hmm. the Navajo Nation back Interesting. up. Interesting, loved your reporting. It was really terrific and added a lot to the whole political scene here in the state of New Mexico. Gwyneth, good to see you, of course. You spoke with our congressional candidates in your series, and I, I'm gonna recommend again, in case you haven't missed those folks, it's okay to peel back and see those as well. They're very informative. Um, Gabe Vasquez going to, into election night, seemed he had a best shot at knocking off an incumbent here, and the incumbent, of Yvette Harrell, did not choose to sit down with you, but Gabe did. I'm curious what you took away from that interview with Gabe Vasquez. You know, it I think we often find it, it's at the end of the interview when people say the most interesting things. Yeah. And it was right at the end that he said, I got a house and a dog and a truck. <laughs> and, and like I'm unencumbered is yep. what he was saying. I'm mm -hmm. ready to go. And I just thought, oh, that's like the most New Mexican thing mm -hmm. in the world, right? right? Here's a dude. He's got a dog <laughs> and a truck, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and I'll come back to the dog because sure. I thought that when he was talking about guns, he was very nuanced. And that's where I really saw him sort of um, trying to speak to the middle right. of that district there. You know, um, I, th I think we saw him sort of echoing one of his mentors, Martin Heinrich, right. who, you know, is a hunter and talked about that. And he was, you know, he was endorsed by the NRA in 2010. He had an A rating. Right. Um, and he has since kind of peeled that back. He's not a member of the NRA anymore, mm -hmm. and he's been talking much more about some gun restrictions. But, you know, when you look at Gabe Vasquez's website, there's these pictures of him he's sitting in the truck with the dog. <laughs> but, you know, it's a pointer of some kind, and he's got that yellow hunting radio collar on. And so he's, he's definitely trying to position him some, himself, I think, mm -hmm. um, in that center place. Interesting in your interview though, you really did put it to him straight on would he be for an assault weapons ban if it came up in Congress? That really kind of th looked like it threw him just yeah, a little bit. He did not want to answer that. That's right. <laughs> no, he did not. Interesting. Yeah, I, you know, and it was interesting that he was so outspoken on abortion yes. in that interview yes. and unequivocally pro-choice, yep. but then hedgy on guns. Right. Um, I know you reached out to the Herald people quite a bit. Um, do you think they missed something not being with us and not being with you? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we give people this opportunity to just speak directly to the voters. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not pouncing on them with crazy questions. Mm -hmm. It, it really is an opportunity. I think the people who come get an opportunity right. to add, add explanation, add feeling, add that personal touch and, right. and some of their biography and real feelings to the answers instead of just being words on a page. That's right, and that, that came out in all your interviews. There was a little something extra about them in your questioning that brought it out. It was really kind of cool. Uh, Antonio, last month, the All Public Council of Governors held an event hosting candidates um, up and down the ballot to talk about how they would address indigenous needs if elected. You were at that event uh, for sure, and what are some of the issues that came up? Well, it's interesting because um, they invited all of the candidates for all three congressional races, mm -hmm. and all everyone showed up except for Gabe uh, Vasquez. He right. had a representative there. Even Harold was there, and um, she okay. talked to the tribal leaders, um, talking about being on a subcommittee for indigenous people in the natural uh, House Resources Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, she talked about working on relationships with tribes. Mm -hmm. um, she, she also talked about co-sponsoring bills with the Democratic um, representatives of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and then she was asked about um, improving land into trust. How can that um, work out? And she was also asked about uh, irrigation. Um, one of the things too that she talked about was helping get 
um, the healthcare center for ACMA Pueblo because oh, okay. that was a big deal here in New Mexico and right. um, that hospital uh, shut down emergency services. So she talked a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would say that kind of the feel of the event for the congressional races, there wasn't really a lot of big fanfare for any one right. <laughs> candidate, either the incumbents or the challengers. Um, I would say maybe there was a few more claps for um, Congresswoman Teresa Legere Fernandez mm -hmm. um, because she is the chair of the um, Indigenous Peoples Committee, uh, the subcommittee, gotcha. um, and she represents a number of Pueblos, also Navajo Nation um, and uh, some Apache communities. So I think that was kind of the feel of that as far as the congressional um, candidates, but when it comes to the state, that's also of top concern. Um, they invited both uh, 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 Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham and Mark Ronchetti mm -hmm. and other state mm -hmm. um, uh, candidates seeking state seats. Um, and what's interesting about that is um, the governor was um, on the southern border, sh so she was not able to make it, but the lieutenant governor came in her place. Okay. And um, Ronchetti came t early to a meet and greet um, and stayed for a little bit, but he did not stay for the entire um, event. And so some some people were wondering why he left gotcha. um so hey, that you, yeah you so that was pretty much a little bit at the event uh, i did yeah, yeah i did i interviewed him mm -hmm. and he talked about you know living here um for more than 25 years right. and getting to know uh, some of the tribal leaders and his his run for congress and um, learning about tribal issues that way mm -hmm. and there's 23 tribes in new mexico there's 19 pueblos and this event was for the 19 pueblos of new mexico right. um, they also represent one pueblo in texas and so um it's interesting because i asked him if he was reaching out to both you know the navajo nation and the apache tribes in the state and he said yes he was and i asked him what his top concern was um, and he said education okay. and improving education and he wanted he wants to improve reading and start reading programs for tribes okay. um, so that's kind of some of the things that he said and um, the other state you know candidates for other offices were there as well right Gwyneth only bounced uh, to cd3 early returns show a sizable lead for uh, ms uh, teresa legere fernandez and your interview with Alexis Martinez Johnson during the campaign was pretty interesting too. Are you surprised at all at how this is playing out given no. what you know? I mean, you know, Legere Fernandez had a huge fundraising advantage, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, she was always ahead in the in the public polls, right, right at least. Right. Um, she's she's also got really deep roots in the heart of that district, right? You know, she grew up in Vegas, she's been living in Santa Fe for a long time. Yep. Martinez Johnson, you know, was born in Roswell, uh, and she lives in Santa Fe now, but she spent a lot of time down in the oil patch working right. as, an, as a consultant for the oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I think also the work that Legere Fernandez was doing in Santa Fe um, kind of put her in a, a really advantageous spot for this job. She's doing this public interest law firm, working on things like pub right. public health. She worked representing tribes and pueblos in redistricting. She's got this right. deep history there, yeah. uh, like Antonia said. And so I think she's got a broader set of connections that maybe um, go a little farther across lines than Alexis right. Martinez Johnson. She's a really charismatic candidate, That'd you know? I think yeah. um, it was a fun interview to do. Um, and she got really passionate, especially about abortion, which yes. was interesting. And yep. this has been such a difficult topic for all of these candidates right. who were so hardcore in the primaries and then er, had to put the brakes on <laughs> and kind of peel it back a little bit. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, some candidates did that better than others, but I thought her passion was genuine. Mm -hmm. She's, you know, yeah. Absolutely. CD1, you also interviewed, of course, um, uh, well, Michelle Garcia Holmes refused. Uh, she turned us down to interview. You didn't get a chance to speak with her. But Melanie Stansbury, what did you take away from that interview? Um, I'm really sorry. I just want to say I'm really sorry that Michelle Garcia Holmes didn't want to talk to us. Yeah. Um, because I think she has a really compelling story. Right. You know, her work as a detective, working on uh, crimes against children mm -hmm. and sexual violence, domestic violence. She's got a resume that's really interesting to talk about. And I think people would have liked to hear more. Sure. Um, Melanie Stansbury is, you know, sort of the opposite kind of character. Um, uh, Garcia Holmes has got all this grit and on the street experience and all right. this connection, um, you know, especially in Albuquerque and, and in 
crime, which is such a huge issue in the district. And Stansbury didn't really address that um, as passionately as I think Garcia Holmes could have, right? right. Yeah. Um, but Stansbury, you know, she's been working in policy for sure. a long time, yeah. right? Um, she, you know, I think what's interesting about her is, you know, she traveled all around the state working for the Museum of Natural History early mm -hmm. in her career. Mm -hmm. um, I think she's been kind of making the rounds. She worked in the Obama administration. She kind of set herself up for this. She served in the, in the House for that one term. Yep. Um, she's a wonk and she comes yeah. across that way, yeah, yeah. you know? It would have been yeah. great to pair them against each other. Mm -hmm. um, she's deep in policy. She's got all the numbers at the top of her head. She's working all these different issues. She's full of energy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the numbers are probably on her side, right? Yeah, yeah very much so as at this point of the night. So interesting to listen to you interview her as a scientist, as a politician. She comes across as a scientist because she is. I mean, it's just really kind of encouraging. Is that a word I could use it fairly? Gwyneth Dolan, Antonio Gonzalez, thank you for being here tonight. Don't go anywhere, guys. In about five minutes, we're going to bring back our panel of New Mexico journalists for even more insight as results come in. That's right after the second half of senior producer Lou DeVizio's interview with New Mexico First Executive Director Daniel Gonzalez and Heather Ballas from the Election Reformers Network as they discuss a new candidate principles initiative. You mentioned to me in our pre-conversation about some reforms that could happen to also push this along. So it's not directly tied to the candidate principles. It's instead sure. a standalone bill that um, uh, we hope will be introduced in the upcoming legislative session. And it's focused on the role of the Secretary of State and our county clerks. And just this week, the Election Reformers Network has released new national polling data um, that, asks, that asked voters how important it was that their election administrators behave in an impartial manner. And it won't surprise you to know that Democrats, Republicans alike, they want this badly. They think it's very important to the tune of 95% of them think it's very important. Um, and then when you take the, that group, though, and you pull it down a little bit further, 66 68 percent of them, two-thirds roughly, um, of the folks uh, polled also said that they have a hard time trusting their, uh, the impartiality of their election officials when those folks are elected with the backing of a major party. And so this is America. That's how we do it, right? We elect people in a partisan election. But the thing is that we don't, doesn't have to be done that way. And so the opportunity to say, how do we sort of depoliticize those roles um, also has a profound effect on the confidence that voters have that the election's being administered fairly. So the bill that we're looking to introduce um, would do three things, uh, and they're just common sense, simple things. The, uh, one is that election officials would be prohibited from uh, uh, endorsing candidates in the elections that they're overseeing, which most people go, well, aren't they prohibited from doing that already? And the answer is they're not prohibited, but most of them don't do it. Um, it would also prohibit them from fundraising for candidates um, in the elections they're overseeing. And it would require them to recuse themselves if there was an election dispute over their own race. Um, so three simple common sense things. In doing that, the suggestion is not being made because we're trying to be accusatory or imply that those folks are doing their, doing their jobs badly right now. I think quite the contrary. They're doing um, heroic work, a job that's really hard, and in the political environment we're in is getting harder every day. Now looking ahead to November 8th, is there anything that either of you would be looking for, some sort of a barometer through voters, through uh, public perceptions, that we're on the right track, moving a little bit away from that ultra polarization and towards strengthening and reinvigorating our democracy. I mean, I think I would re be remiss to not mention the candidate principles. Sure. And so to the degree to which candidates are willing to sign on to those principles and which voters are saying these matter to me, I think that's a huge indicator and barometer that this is important. I think the other is obviously voter turnout rates. That's critically important. Um, and then I think once the election comes and goes, we really need to have folks accept results when it's clear. And so to Heather's point earlier, that it's entirely acceptable to issue challenges, to ask for recounts, but there is a point at which candidates and their parties and their supporters must accept those results. So I think if all of those things happen, I think that's the best indicator that we are in a, in a good place. But I, but I won't pretend that it all is gonna end on November 10th. 
right? Like right. this is the midterm election. We've got another election coming in, in two years. And so this is just going to continue to build. Um, so I'm really excited to think about this as sort of a first step or all of these initiatives together as first steps to help rebuild what has begun to, to, to break and, and to um, have some cracks as we talked kind of sort of at the beginning of the interview. Heather, something you'll be looking for in this election moving into 2024 also? Something that I'm looking for right now on the candidate principles front is not just for the candidates themselves to sign on to those, but also for organizations and voters. And so one of the things I would share with your viewers is that whether they're running for office or whether they simply like the concept that people would say, um, yes, I want my candidate to take this kind of approach, they can um, voice their support um, signing on to the principles that we've talked about um, at any time at the website principledcandidates.org. Heather Ballas, Danielle Gonzalez, thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you all for staying with New Mexico in Focus and NMPBS for our coverage of Election Night 2022. We have an eye on results as they slowly come in. Right now, we want to open things up to our reporter roundtable. Journalists from around the state are going to be hopping in and out of our virtual conversation, but we're happy to have a few mainstays. Megan Kamerick is news director at KUNA FM. Trip Jennings is the executive director of New Mexico In Depth, and Marisa DeMarco, editor in chief at Source New Mexico. Thank you all for being here. We got a couple of more folks I'll name off here in a quick second. Megan, starting with you in the governor's race, you were there when President Biden touched down in Albuquerque just a few days ago to campaign for Governor Lujan Grisham. I get a question. How important was that visit in terms of rallying support during the final days for the governor? Oh, you're muted there, I believe. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. I think it was really important, Gene. Um, you know, I had read one evaluation saying, uh, or, or context of the visit saying he was going to places that seemed fairly safe in mm. terms of the electoral outcome. Um, but also when I first heard that he was visiting, I was like, oh, I mean, I'm not the political veteran trip is, for example, or Russell, but my first thought was like, oh, do they think she's in trouble? Is that what the National Party does? They like send him out there because they think this is really close. But mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think it was a dual thing to help her and help the other Democrats, but also to bolster him, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a tough midterm, because we know that sitting parties often lose big in midterm elections. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think I got a lot of people out for sure. Yeah. Um, Marisha DeMarco, let me bump to you, editor-in-chief, of course, at Source New Mexico. And your team has been covering, got some other team members here in a second I'll get to as well. Your team has been covering a lot of different angles this election season. And coming in tonight, coming into tonight, what was the biggest storyline you were watching coming into this? Oh, I mean, you know, I think probably the, the big ones that everyone's, everyone's watching, right? Like uh, yeah. the CD2 race. I know um, Patrick Lohman, who's on here with us, did yep. some reporting about how the South Valley got looped into that second congressional district. And we have um, the balance of power in Congress is hinging on just a couple of races, right? Um, and so mm -hmm. people in the South Valley, as Patrick reported, are voting on... Um, between two candidates in another part of the state uh, and their questions are around whether or not those candidates will be able to prioritize them and speak to their interests mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. um so that redistricting and congressional district two is huge the governor's race of course ryan lowry is here um he did some reporting for source new mexico as well mm -hmm. um about that race um including um kind of the proximity of Republican Party to um, election deniers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how there's this there's this kind of tension right now between some members of the party who are on the ticket, like Audrey Trujillo in the Secretary of State's race, who are election deniers, the yeah. 2020 election deniers. Um, and then you have Ren Ketty, who's trying to shoot more middle of the road and appeal um, to, to more voters. Um, but who's who uh, was also taking um, campaign donations from fake electors, right? Mm -hmm. And so Ryan did that reporting for us as well. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the big themes that we've been following. But we did also send reporters to the burn scar, both on primary election day and today. Megan Gleason spent the whole day driving around Mora County. She's oh, wow. in Las Vegas, New Mexico right now. Huh. Um, and just kind of looking at what it's like to hold an election either during a natural disaster as with the primaries or uh, kind of right after one, right? Mm -hmm. 
So she's saying like sandbags at polling locations in case there's flooding, um, all kinds of stuff about what does an election mean up there right now, wow. right? And what what's the issue there? And I think really the the big issue there is are those FEMA dollars going to reach the people and reach them expediently mm -hmm. and reach them fairly? And is there going to be a good process for applying for that? And that all comes down to um, who the representatives and public officials are in a lot of ways, right? Yeah. The, community, the community can do a lot, but the congressional race up there is really important. Um, and then, you know, other elected officials, county officials, county commission officials, like that, that all really matters when it comes to interfacing with the federal government to pull down $2.5 billion in compensation after this natural disaster of the summer. Interesting. Haley Bounce to Patrick, the previously named Patrick Lohman, reporter at Source New Mexico, of course. You wrote an interesting article about how turnout will determine Gabe Vasquez's fate in CD2, as Marisa mentioned just a second ago. Does it look like it's still the case as we sit here right now, Patrick? Uh, well, I just checked. It looks like um, Bernalillo County is only now starting to report some of its um, uh, uh, totals. Um, it's still very early on, as far as I can see. Um, and uh, though, uh, you know, the the proportion for Democrats in that district seems to be exactly what the Democrats were hoping for in redistricting. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the ratio will be such or the turnout will be such to, you know, carry or counteract, you know, all of the uh, influence down south. But that's something I'm I'm certainly paying attention to. Um, after redistricting happened, they looped in about um, 50,000 um, new Democrats in Bernalillo County alone into CD2 and about 25,000 Republicans. So um, however many of them turn out, um, I think is going to be something that um, that Gabe Vasquez is really paying attention to. And I also saw that he was in um, on the west side of Albuquerque today, potentially trying to make one last push. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Seriously. Yeah. Let me, let me yeah, ask let me ask you about that. And, you know, a lot of us here earlier at the table <laughs> were wondering how both Harold and Vasquez did in this new part of their district. Was there a, amount of, a lot of time spent up here? I mean, your sense of how you uh, saw them campaigning in this new part of their district up here. I'm very curious. Yeah, well, I did ask voters what they thought, if they felt that they were being spoken to from candidates 200 miles away. Um, right. And they, um, you know, they said that basically that they were just being inundated with ads about the issues that I think are being, um, you know, trying to motivate voters across the country, abortion, crime, uh, COVID lockdowns, inflation, things like that. So I didn't hear any voter tell me, though I only spoke to, you know, a few of them and they're all painted in Calavera makeup, um, whether they would be... Um, like whether they felt individually spoken to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but that said, you know, they were all, they all seemed to kind of share the National Democrats' mission of trying to keep, help the Democrats keep the House. They all said that even, even though their representatives are 200 miles away, that doesn't, you know, um, they, they'd still love it if the Democrats could keep the House and they're happy to be kind of thrown around from one district to another if that, if it helps them accomplish that goal. Yeah. So. Hey, last question on this. Um, why no Gabe Vasquez at the Biden visit? Any intel on that? Um, you know, I, I was definitely wondering the same thing. Yeah. I would love if any panelists had more insight. I, I have a couple of theories, I guess, but mm -hmm. um, if anyone knows better, jump in. <laughs> Megan, any, did you have any sense, any uh, scuttle? Did you hear anything when you were there? I actually, you know, I have to admit, Gene, that um, my reporters, Nash and Bryce, were at the events where Biden, Biden spoke. Yeah. I was just me and the photogs out at watching Air Force One land because I thought it would be cool. So it was. It was. I didn't. <laughs> and I was very far away. Let so me, um, that's add, interesting, though, that uh, Biden or that he wasn't, that Vasquez wasn't there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Algernon Damasa, Deming Headlight. Uh, congratulations, by the way, on the new gig. Got to gotta tip the hat to you there. Any intel on why no Gabe Vasquez at the Biden visit? Something seems somewhat off here. All I know is that when President Biden was giving his endorsement to Mr. Vasquez, uh, Gabe Vasquez was actually here in Luna County going door to door. OK. And although I don't have any particular intel, uh, you know, I look at that as the fact that there was just not a vote to lose. Uh -huh. um, and especially in some of the more conservative parts of the second congressional district, mm -hmm. you can see this if you were to look at Luna County's results alone, for instance. Uh, this is a county that even 2020, even though uh, Joe Biden beat President Trump by 11 points, 
In Luna County, it was just the reverse. And yeah. this county went for Trump. And so uh, Gabe Vasquez, although he is, um, I think he's somewhat better known here than he is in perhaps uh, Albuquerque South Valley. Still, there just wasn't a single vote for him to lose. And I think he just felt like what he really needed to do was to be making his case to those voters mm -hmm. and not having to uh, deal with having a photo op with President Biden during the midterm. I could see it. I could see it. Hey, Trip Jennings, good to have you, by the way, as always, Executive Director at New Mexico In Depth. Um, give us a sense of the coverage I mean, you guys are, are following here. Then I got some specific questions about uh, your shop and what you're looking to do. But how did you guys approach the election this cycle? You know, really, we covered more than money in politics. You know, we did a big story on, on basically um, how, you know, they changed the requirements for contribution limits back in way back when. In, I think 2018, right. and you can really see the difference. Uh, they were both Ron Ketty and Lujan Grisham were scooping up uh, large amounts of money from people, families, corporations, that kind of thing that were, you know, basically um, it, they bundled. Uh, in 2018, you saw a lot of small donors. Mm -hmm. So you saw a change in the contribution, uh, basically, where the money was coming from. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, we're looking at the money in politics and the kind of like patterns of giving. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where we focused. Um, Could I go back to the question about Vasquez sure and, and Biden? Absolutely. Um, I, I don't think that, you know, being seen with Biden actually helps Vasquez too much in the second congressional district. Right. I mean, that's part of it, which is the optics, you know, that people take photos and then suddenly, you know, you've got new ads coming out in the last days of the election. Mm -hmm. uh, that's this is just speculation on my part. Sure. Uh, I don't know anything, but I, I would imagine that was part of the, the analysis. I don't know, but if anybody caught it, his last weekend radio ads, uh, Mr. Vasquez was quoting President Reagan in his radio ads. I don't know if you guys caught that. It was very interesting. Russell Contreras. <laughs> right, exactly. Russell Contreras, one of our great correspondents, by the way, congratulations on your baseball team winning the Houston Astros. I know you're a big fan, that's for sure. Um, let's talk about turnout in specifically in these congressional races. How, who, who was it better for to have a good turnout? And we're still looking to see what the turnout numbers are gonna be, but it's looking pretty healthy at this point. Who fares better with a good turnout here? Well, definitely the Democrats were going to fare better with a good turnout. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking initially at turnouts in um, Luna County and Don Yannick County, and I thought it was low, and I thought that would have been trouble for Gabe Vasquez. And then I looked at Bernalillo County. Um, it did seem like enough Democrats went to the polls, but at a time where there was a lot of uncertainty. We, we had Axios did a number of polls, especially among Hispanic voters. Mm -hmm. And when you ask them, what party do you favor? They had critiques of both parties. They would say Republicans tend to be hateful and racist, but Democrats were condescending. Uh -huh. And if you stay that, and, then they, and if you ask them about the top issues, crime and uh, the economy were number one. And those were two issues that Republicans did fairly well. So we thought we may see some Hispanic conservative Democrats flip to the Republicans. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that across the country, but did enough. And what I saw in the last days of the campaign was that both sides were going to their base, which means they uh -huh. were they're basically doing all we did, all we could do, all we could to get independence. Now we got to get our base out, right. which is why um, the Ron Ketty camp really promoted the Trump endorsement, which is why Lujan Grisham went to President Biden. And I can say on, on the District CD2 race that the, the operatives I talked to said, yes, that they, they was smart for the Vasquez to stay away from Biden. Right. If he's quoting... Reagan, and you have Yvette Hurl on the other side saying she's going to reach across the aisle. Right. Um, it seemed like bizarre world where right. <laughs> Yvette Hurl is part of the Freedom Caucus, does not return reporters' calls. We are the enemy, and she's invested in a lot of conspiracy theorists. You know I've been on the show a number of times when I was at the AP, and I would cover both of her races. Mm -hmm. It was very hard to get her on the phone. I had to go to Hobbs to get an interview with her. Wow. So but all of a sudden now she's Heather Wilson, it seemed like a very big, a, a big push. It, it just seemed just unrealistic. But at the same time, I saw a lot of signs for her, or I had colleagues that saw a lot of signs for her in the South Valley. 
So I thought, okay, well, maybe the Democrats aren't doing, doing what they Hold need on. to do. Hold on. Russell, hang on a quick right. sec. The whole group, just take a pause right there because we're going to be right back with you guys as we wrap up our live broadcast on NMPBS Channel 5.4. Now, thank you to all of our political experts, Gwyneth Dolan and Antonio Gonzalez. And, of course, to all of you Reporter Roundtable folks, our coverage does not end here. We're continuing this very discussion you're watching live online on our New Mexico and Focus YouTube and Facebook pages. You can also find a link at nmpbs.org. Now, for now, thank you for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you this Friday night in Focus. If you made the hop over from 5.4 to online here, we're going to continue this discussion. We don't want to leave out Ryan Lowry. Ryan, I didn't forget about you, bro. Don't worry. <laughs> I got you covered now. Hey, um, you're a freelance reporter at Source New Mexico, of course, and you've written several articles about the finances that was touched on a little bit earlier in the election, but specifically in the governor's race. Did you find any interesting donors out there for either candidate? <laughs> Interesting would be a good word, yeah. Um, you know, something we reported heavily on at Source uh, was that the Ronchetti camp has taken uh, now at least fifteen thousand dollars from uh, four people linked to various ways of trying to overthrow the twenty twenty presidential election. Oh, wow. Three of them were so called fake electors um, who signed phony paperwork here in New Mexico, awarding falsely awarding the states electoral votes to Trump when Biden won the state. Um, and then another one is John Eastman, the battled yeah. Trump lawyer who right. um, you know, donated to Ron Ketty's campaign as well. So yeah, interesting is, is a good word for it. <laughs> you also put out an interesting, is that word again, explainer on the certification process. Uh, an important issue after the saga that played out in Otero County earlier this year, as we all know. Are, are there any signs we could have, have to deal with a similar situation after this election? Or is it too early to say, or what are you gleaning out there? I would say it's too early to say. Okay. Um, you know, I, 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 the, the process is pretty straightforward, but we are in, to use the word again, interesting times. And um, yeah, it's, it's to, be, to be determined who's going to challenge um, any of the results from tonight um, yeah. and what, what that will entail. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I think in general, we should be seeing, uh, um, a pretty standard process, but you just never know, especially right. now. <laughs> Election denial that we were speaking about a little bit ago yep. um, are very prevalent and uh, no telling where where these kind of challenges will pop up. Mm -hmm. um, Marisa, I got a question. Um, Megan Gleason, of course, a reporter at your shop, uh, been tuned into the work going into making sure voting locations are safe. Insecure as the DOJ deploys personnel to polling places around Berlioz County and San Juan counties, I should add as well. Are you aware of any reported issues at this point? Does anything come in? You know, we checked, I want to say it's around 6.30, 6, 630, and okay. we had not heard anything. Um, so we checked in with Common Cause New Mexico and also the Secretary of State's office. Um, there were some minor things here and there, but really nothing very significant. I think we have a, a write-up of a small issue at a polling location. Mm -hmm. um, and I also know that Alice Fordham, who's down south tonight reporting um, from the CDT watch parties, also did some checking around in that area mm -hmm. with the county clerks and, and didn't really hear anything. So it really does sound like um, the election ran pretty smoothly today from what we've heard so far. Yeah. Uh, it could be that Tomorrow we're finding out about other things that have happened, but um, but yeah, it did run smoothly. The DOJ was coming out here with concerns about language, um, accessibility, about intimidation or discrimination. 
Um, and uh, maybe we'll hear back from the DOJ about what they saw or didn't see mm -hmm. while they were here. But I think that effort overall was about protecting voters' rights. Um, and and it looks like there was success here in New Mexico. Um, as far as election challenges, which Ryan was just speaking to, mm -hmm. um, k Emma Gibson did talk to Audra Chahio, who is the Republican candidate for Secretary of State, who said that if results are close tonight and she loses, she does intend to challenge the results. Oh, no kidding. Uh, okay. So she said okay. that, what, like an hour, hour and a half ago or so? Mm -hmm. um, you know, she, she said, said if there's a landslide, she will not. But if it's close, she will. I don't know what she defines as a landslide. Hmm. That's so. an excellent point. Um, She's down yeah. a bunch of votes right now. So I, you know, <laughs> it'd be hard to steal 60,000 plus votes. Let's put it that way. Um, let me get the bounce of Russell Contreras. Um, we have clearly, dovetailing of what Marisa just described, we've, we're not in the Arizona place where you've got armed people that dropped off boxes and all the stuff <clears throat> that we've been reading about nationally. But the real fun obviously comes later with the kind of challenges. Are we worse off with close races that need a little bit of time to count? Does that just feed the problem here? Or do we need the Secretary of State? Is there pressure to release votes of final tallies in somewhat of a quick manner to get around that? <clears throat> yeah, I think that's the conflict. You want yeah. a released vote to be as transparent as possible. But if we see, especially in the CD2 race uh, for a couple of years ago, uh, well, four years ago, when Sochi Torres Small was in a close rate with, with you, Brett Harold, right. that Doniana County took their time. And they took their time, uh, and it took a couple of days, and they were very slow and deliberate. That, I think we all agreed at that time, was needed. But then the Yvette Herald campaign challenged them, but it wasn't a challenge that a lot of people took seriously. And what mm -hmm. she did after a while was drop the challenge and immediately begin her reelection campaign. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have the same problems that other states are having, like you mentioned Arizona. Right. I think there are others that we're, we're pretty much in a good shape, but there will be challenges. Uh, that's, that's happened. We've seen it in, in county races. And I think we can anticipate more. Mm -hmm. Trip Jennings, a follow up on that. We know Secretary of State Toulouse Oliver is working remotely at an undisclosed location tonight. Now, they say it's a safety precaution after threats she received after the 2020 election and picking up during the certification saga in Otero County, certainly. But what does it say about where we are as a state and more importantly, as a democracy, that the person counting our votes is in hiding in, in potential danger? What, what does that say about us? <laughs> I mean, I, I've never seen anything like this. The last five years, uh, right. I've been around elections for 30 something years. Um, you can read about this kind of stuff, maybe in the history books, um, right. but uh, this is a situation. And, you know, I think about this in the context of other states where like in Georgia in 2020, actually there were people in hiding because there were a lot of death threats against Raffensperger's yep. staff and Raffensperger himself. Mm -hmm. um, with New Mexico, uh, I think we're in a safer place, like Russell was saying. We're in a better place than other states. Um, I think we're in the middle of a wrestling of what is this country about? Uh, it's about, uh, you know, are we about uh, <laughs> who's going to take power? Um, there's a lot of fear. Um, and we're getting into debates that I thought I would never see mm -hmm. in uh, American democracy. And it's not over policy. It's over identity. Right. It's over, um, again, power. Who's going to wield that power? Um, how are they going to wield it against their enemies? Um, that's the other thing is there's the debate now. For years and decades, I've seen people debate, and they've been able mostly to to do it in a way that was civil right now there's just a lot of demonization and there's a lot of like this person is bad because they are this mm -hmm. um i i don't know how we recover from this i know we can our institutions are strong but uh, i think we're in something historical right mm -hmm. now we we just are in a historical space right gene i wanted to add Please. uh alice our reporter had did a long story um it's on our website about county clerks they uh -huh. are bearing the brunt of this okay um, they are on the front line of people constantly coming to county commission meetings, challenging, usually with false conspiracy theories. Um, you know, county commissions that have invited the Clemenses to come talk and wow. present. 
And so uh, it's very interesting. She's been following uh, various county clerks for about six months and talking to them. Most of them are women, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. But these are the people responsible for running our elections around the state. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that are facing the threats. And a lot of them are like, I didn't sign up for this. Right. I this is imagine. not what I, I was. I, I want to say, uh, I want to add to what Megan's saying. Otero County clerk down there, her staff. Yeah. Um, they were. I mean, they were doing the Lord's work in the sense of like really, you know, the facts of the votes, and the commission was was challenging this. It was amazing to watch some of those commission meetings earlier in the year, sure. where they were actually defying the facts, the counts. Um, I just want to say, yeah, Megan, uh, what Alice is finding is kind of crazy right now. Yeah. I mean, you had that commission in Fredericksburg, Texas. They all just resigned. So they're like, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. and what are you going to do? I mean, That's how right. much institutional knowledge do you lose? The people who run our elections. That's this a is fair a question. Huge, you know, and yeah. they're just public servants, really. Mm -hmm. You, would, you wouldn't imagine these are elected folks. You'd think they were appointed the way people come at them. You know, it's, it's crazy. Algernon Damas, I got to get a take on from you from where you're at in Deming. You were most recently in Cruces, of course, at your old employer. You saw the whole thing in Otero County up close and personal as well. Is there any trust to be had in the system from some folks in that district at this point? What, what, what could anyone possibly do at this point as a county commissioner or anybody else to, to regain trust? It's, it's really difficult and it's a long game. Yeah, um, you yeah. know, Russell was just talking about <clears throat> 2018. Mm -hmm. when um, Yvette Harrell narrowly lost that contest to Social Torres Small, impounded the ballots, but did not proceed to contest the results. Right. However, uh, at that time, she immediately launched a, a new election campaign on the claim that the election had been taken from her. Yep. And I think that that's an important pivot to note because at that point, it wasn't a legal challenge. It was a messaging challenge. Mm -hmm. And what we have is a serious messaging problem where you can undermine public confidence in our institutions, in election processes that were perhaps opaque to mm -hmm. uh, the common person. It's, it's not hard to undermine confidence in that and therefore the legitimacy of the victors of an election. Mm -hmm. And that's a very corrosive effect. So there's actually two things, you know, a lot of us, I think all of us, we were grown up being told throughout our lives that voting is this important civic duty. And I think for a lot of people, they think of it as one process, which is I get to express my will right. when I throw in my ballot. But there's a second side to that coin. And the second side to that coin is actually yielding to the result, whether your pick won or lost. And that's the thing that I think we have to try to revive somehow. Mm -hmm. Guys, let's go around the horn a little bit. Um, districts and the governor's race we want to take on as well. We've got some other races going. Um, just checking the Secretary of State site one more time. It looks like the Vasquez Herald race is tightening up just a little bit. They've got Vasquez out there with 53% and Herald at 47%. And of course, not all votes are in. So we'll just kind of take that as it goes. Um, let's see, Patrick, let me talk about CD3. And it was interesting to watch the interview Gwyneth uh, Dolan did in our candidate conversations with Teresa Legere Fernandez about the money in running in a, in a, in a district where had just suffered a trauma. There's no other way to put it, a, a massive trauma. I'm curious what, what you gleaned from how the, how the campaigning went in that kind of environment. Yeah, I also watched the uh, Channel 4 debate. It was a 30-minute debate, and they spent about a third of the... 30 minutes just talking about the fire. Uh, the rest of it kind of gave way to the the issues everyone's talking about everywhere. So I was pretty interested in mm -hmm. that 12 minutes. Um, and I would also say it was, you know, a moment that seemed pretty clear that um, uh, Martinez Johnson just sort of um, threw a lot at the wall um, that didn't have much bearing in reality. I mean, sure, you right. talk to anybody up in the burn scar and, um, and they're, they're frustrated with how long it's taken and they're frustrated with FEMA um, and it, and it, and certainly it is taking way, way longer than it should have. But, um, this $2.5 billion was, was never guaranteed to come in the first place. It, right. it, when I was reporting on it months ago, there were a ton of, uh, possibilities that it would, um, be in the national defense authorization act bill, which is still not going to be heard for, for months. Um, and, um, and also, you know, we reported at the time that the, uh, incumbent had, filed legislation within four weeks of the fire asking for for aid um 
So, you know, that was that was a moment where, and I think even KOAT um, fact checked a, a, a statement from Martinez Johnson on that on that front. So, mm-hmm. um, I think that she was trying to to tap into a lot of the anger that a lot of people feel out there, um, and and I think it, it's wholly justified, obviously, given the the origins of the fire and and the way that FEMA has, as our reporting has shown, really dropped the ball in a lot of areas. Um, but uh, I I'm not sure that. Um, at least when I go to the burn scar, uh, I don't hear many people like anger directly at Ledger Fernandez. It's mostly at at FEMA or state or local yeah. uh, threats. You know, I, I, I'm not I, this is an odd question, but I'm not sure what you do as a challenger when the uh, you know the incumbent is able to pull that kind of money you know into a district. Did she did she have any moves left literally after that? I mean, that's a lot of money to come into New Mexico in, in one specific district. Yeah, I think just kind of rhetorical things here and there. She said only now, six months later, it was actually five months. Are we talking about talking about money? Yeah. Um, she said that Democrats called her, who you know, asking for for help, um, you know, during the fires, you know, um, and I'm sure there were a lot of Demo- there are a lot of Democrats up there who uh, might have been calling around asking for mm-hmm. for help wherever they could get it. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, you know, just having just having been focused primarily, excuse me, on the fire itself not to uh in the back and forth with um with the political angle of it um i it, it did seem like that just was um a you know a, a venue of attack that didn't uh didn't land yeah but this is R- my take on it russell i i got a, russell Contreras. i've got a question for you regarding ms leger fernandez i asked this of martha burke uh, in our segment earlier tonight when we were on uh, channel 5.4 are we seeing the be- beginning of something with this uh candidate or or Congressperson, uh, given if she's going to get back in the way things are trending, meaning fairly safe seat. She's proved her bones in Congress in a very interesting way in a short period of time. Is this the beginning of some kind of career in your view? You've watched a lot of politicians over the years. Yeah, technically, she's the most senior uh, member of the House. That's right. Of the New Mexico delegation uh, yeah. by one person. She is, I think, the safest state, you know, just a few months ago. Um, pundits were talking about this could be a vulnerable seat because of redistricting that they took right. away a lot to give the CD2. Mm-hmm. And we've seen tonight that's not the case. Um, she is, and she's pivot. We've had her on Axios a number of, of times where she tells her personal story. She gets excluded a lot, even in the House Gallery. They didn't have her listed as Hispanic, for example. No kidding. They sort of dismissed her, yes. Huh. And so she's she's put herself into a spot where now she's articulating not just the needs of her of her district, but of the state. Now she's going to someone who can kind of unite uh, a fractured state. Um, and nobody sees her as a threat. She doesn't come across like a hardcore ideologue or right. someone who goes to the extreme. So she does position her well. And I think in her district, as we talked about the fire, one thing that I was curious is that this was a failure on part of the federal government. And the person in charge of this particular department is Deb Holland, our former yep. uh, congresswoman from CD1 uh, here. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious to see why she hasn't heard, faced any of the criticism when she, as a secretary, you know, in all my years of covering politics in the Interior Department, has been the least vocal. She came into the, yeah. taking that seat with saying, in her congressional seat, this, I'm going to be, nobody's ever had a voice like mine. Nobody's ever a voice like mine. But we're not hearing the voice. We've had a couple of press conferences where the material itself, investigation into Indian schools, very powerful. But on this issue, I, I think from my perspective, she's sort of skated. Mm. There wasn't that criticism. And I find that very odd because if this had been any other interior secretary, this is somebody who would be really called to the carpet on this. Yeah. Megan, um, we've got obviously we've got new district lines drawn. And I'm curious how, uh, well, let me back up and say it this way. One of Gwyneth's, the points in Gwyneth's interview with her that I found fascinating was Ms. Leger Fernandez very much embraced the new additions to her district because they were rural. She felt like it fit her, that everything she's been about has been about rural needs and rural you know, issues and things like that. And she tried to make it a play, uh, just an extension of who she is and what she does uh, already. And she's up 10 points as, as we sit here now. Was that a, it's a winning actually strategy? the race. AP has called that race. Oh, they have. Okay, good deal. Yep. I'm glad you mm-hmm. mentioned that. AP has called CD3 and CD1 for Stansbury and also the passage of Constitutional Amendment 1. Excellent. Thank you for that for yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, clearly the district um, didn't hurt her, so I'm curious what your, what your yeah, uh, take I, is. I yeah, I saw that. It was a good interview Gwyneth did. Um, you know, yeah, she basically said, how do you 
you know, in Santa Fe, how do you get someone in the oil patch right. essentially to vote for you? And she said, I'm rural New Mexico. I'm all about rural New Mexico and I'm not um, disagreeing with that. But mm -hmm. um, there's I'm not sure it it's necessarily sells for someone who's in Roswell or the Permian Basin. But right. apparently she pulled it out and and was successful. Um, so now, you know, she has two more years to prove that to, in this newly redrawn district that, mm -hmm. you know, does encompass more of that eastern side of the state. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that'll be very interesting to see what she does. Mm -hmm. Marisa, I'm curious your thoughts on uh, our, our uh, CD3 winner now um, called Ms. Leisure Fernandez. What are we seeing here? I mean, again, a 10 point win. Again, her, the challenger was a second time challenger and the, the gap was even wider last time. but. Does this absolutely solidify her in this district? Thinking, thinking ahead a little bit, two years goes by very quickly. How do you challenge yeah, somebody who's come off two wins like this? I mean, again, so we're talking about Ledger Fernandez yes. and three CD3, which, mm -hmm. you know, encompasses the, the burn scar. And I'm sorry that it sounds like that's what, I, what I'm talking about so much today. But um, I think a challenge comes, you know, in two years, mm -hmm. depending on how that $2.5 billion comes down to New Mexico mm -hmm. and whether or not people feel like Ledger Fernandez did enough to make sure that it was distributed quickly and adequately um, and programs put in place. There's all this, there's all kinds of um, debate or controversy over cultural, uh, whether people are culturally appropriate in dealing with the folks up there, mm -hmm. uh, whether they have enough Spanish speakers, for instance, um, whether they understand this community and its history and all of the different problems that um, things like, um, you know, not having addresses in the same way that everybody else does, for instance, presents when you're filing FEMA applications. And so is Ledger Fernandez, does she understand her district well enough to bridge that gap? I think that's how you, how, what she'll, the question that she'll be facing in two years. That's mm -hmm. what I think she'll he'll be facing. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, I, Cave, one of our reporters was up at the watch parties and was at the Alexis Martinez Johnson one and said that, um, you know, none of the folks there were somber necessarily. Um, he sort of kept hearing this idea that they're making a little bit of progress every time in a region where really they're still pretty much outnumbered. Right. Right. Interesting point there. Um, it has been called, as Megan um, Kemmerich from KUNM reported, a uh, CD1 is in, and Melanie Stansbury. And Tripp, let me go to you on this. Um, I'm not sure if there was, it was really under question. Again, Michelle Garcia Holmes, she's been a challenger for a couple times now and didn't quite get it to bite. But I'm curious, crime was such a big issue, especially for CD1. It's not a congressional issue, but you know how that goes. It spills over. Everybody gets tainted if you're in elective office. Um, but it didn't really seem to ring. Um, what, what do you think happened there? And not so much why Ms. Stansbury won, but why her challenger could not make any more inroads on that issue. You know, I, I think that, that, congress, that the, the, the days of the Congressional District 1 being a, a, a battle zone where you had Heather Wilson with Patricia Madrid 2006, right. where it was <laughs> in the top 10 races of the country, yep. uh, those things are gone. Um, there's, 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 it's a pretty solidly Democratic uh, district. Um, you know, I, I will say that they, you know, they... Um, I have lived in uh, a part of the state that has always been in District 3, but for the first time in 17 years, I am now in District 1. So they've incorporated part of Rio Rancho into oh, that's right again. Uh, yep. CD1, and that did not change necessarily. And the thing is, is that Stansbury, you know, I kind of, I, I, I covered her just a bit in the legislature. And you know what? She is a total wonk. And whoever mm -hmm. said that, that is totally correct. Yes. And she doesn't. <laughs> She, she doesn't I don't find her to be totally like a, a bomb thrower. She kind of like it is about the policy. Mm -hmm. So I think in some ways you've got all these things. CD1 is, you know, basically no longer a battleground district. You've got someone in there who doesn't really bomb throw. She's really about the policy. She can talk to stuff, too. She knows water. Right. Uh, that helps, too. And um, can I go back to CD3 as Please. well? Absolutely. Uh, sure. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, historically, CD3 has been strongly Democratic. The last time that that may have 
uh, it, it was one time when Bill Richardson back in good lord was it 92 93 when he was uh, went to the uh, Clinton administration where there was an open seat and um, a Republican won. Mm-hmm. And then it's been Democratic ever since. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a, a, a situation where if you're in CD3 and you're a Democrat, you you kind of own that seat for a while. Now, redistricting might change this over the next decade, but I wouldn't count on it. Yeah. I just, historically, it has been a, a really solid Democratic seat. Mm-hmm. Let's go to we're gonna run out just a little bit of time here. Um, want to make sure we get in. By the way, we're still holding at uh, CD two. Secretary of State's office still at forty seven percent for Ms. Harrell and fifty three percent for Gabe Vasquez. I'm so fascinated by this race. I can't kind of can't take my eyes off of it. Um, Russell, let me ask you this about about CD one as we as we wrap this bit up. It, it's, it's the center of economic activity, you know, blah, blah, blah. There was always a lot of angst sometimes from the other two districts. When I was in the congressional office, when, when Heather Wilson was there about, we were sort of like the big elephant stomping around the state. But now that we have a part, a big part of it in the South Valley kind of carved away, is CD1 as influential as it was previously? Is it the same? Will it be more so? I'm trying to curious where, where you see the, the CD1 in the mix compared to other, state, uh, other districts in our state now. Well, yes and no. It still encompasses much of uh, Albuquerque. It's still the cultural center. Yeah. Uh, Santa Fe usually likes to claim it, but it's usually Albuquerque. It's basically the city. It's where we're, all the films are made. Mm-hmm. But I also think one of the things that we have not seen tested is we don't have good, as, as to be frank, good candidate quality. And it's largely because of, of the state of the Republican Party. I've talked to a number of Republicans yep. who say we're not going to get good candidate quality as long as we have a national MAGA Trump Um, sort of ethos defining us because as I mentioned, Heather Wilson's not walking in that door and a Heather Wilson type candidate could take this seat and make it very competitive, but could a Heather Wilson to yeah, 2.0 get out of the primary. And that is the problem now with all three seats. You can see this right now. I I think with some Republicans have thought, okay, that's even if that Harold down the CD2 was facing a tough time. If this had been a Steve Pierce seat, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Right? Right. Or if, if, if uh, uh, Heather Wilson was in that seat, you would not have this conversation. But you're going to have this conversation. And right now, there is going to be a battle if this is going to be the third election in a row or the fourth election in a row mm-hmm. that the Republicans are going to suffer losses. Is it time for the Republican baby boomers to just get out of the way and let Gen X and, and the millennials take over that party? Mm-hmm. As, as Mr. Oh Foley God. has said on this seat, That's right. saying, here are the keys. Take it over. That's right. That's right. There's a, there's, there's a bubbling something. Dan Foley was talking about it. Representative Foley was talking about that earlier tonight. It was just really, uh, something's got to break on the Republican side there. It, it's, it's become untenable as far as they're concerned. Uh, guys, as we're, as we're talking, just want to check in on the governor's race, of course. Secretary of State's office still has uh, our governor and Howie Morales, of course. 53% in Mr. Ronchetti and uh, Ann Thornton at 44%. And about a hundred and a half thousand outstanding votes there. So we're getting close to that time where perhaps a call might be made. I'm not sure. Marisa, um, I know you guys have been leading into this a little bit as well. This is kind of an open question, but what's, what, one of the things I asked the panel earlier uh, tonight was, Mr. Ronchetti needed to make inroads with women. It, it, you just had to go there. And the abortion situation stopped him dead cold. Could he have done anything differently to get inroads with women and more votes after the Smotherman thing blew up in, in Mr. Ronchetti's face there? I mean, I guess I don't know if it's that cut and dried in the sense that um, there are plenty of conservative women, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. John Griswold was in the field uh, speaking to voters in western New Mexico and in around the Gallup area. He spoke with a number of women who were voting uh, for Ron Ketty because they um, they were voting about abortion, right? right? So I just I just don't I just don't know that it plays out exactly the way that the simple way that we would imagine that it does. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say that I'm hearing from Gina Gutierrez with KSFR, who's in the field and at Ron Ketty's watch party. Um, that Ron Ketty is maybe about to take the stage, is okay. what we're hearing. Interesting. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure um, exactly if if I'm getting that all right, but that's 
that's what we're starting that's to okay. see is that um, maybe things are shifting at the elections watch parties and maybe we should start expecting to see some results here coming up soon. It sounds like a call might be close, that's for sure. Guys, just to round it out here real quick, Maggie Toulouse-Oliver is holding in at 56% versus Ms. Trujillo at 41%. Has, let me ask you guys, has the call for attorney, uh, attorney general been made? I don't see that on my end. Megan, are you seeing anything? Anybody seeing if that's been made? Okay. Uh, let me look I real don't quick, see Okay. We're not seeing AG yet. Okay. No. Anybody surprised Raul Torres is doing as well as he is? 57%. Jeremy Gay, no. 43%. Is that a surprise to anybody? Trip, trip. Not surprised to me. Yeah. Why, why, no, why so? I mean, I, I, uh, part of the reason I say that is because I think it's been decades since a Republican has won attorney general. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's Literally been decades. decades right. Um, <laughs> Um, except for in the Secretary of State's office, it's been decades, except for Diana Duran, mm -hmm. um, you know, who defeated Mary Herrera, who was so. And, but there were extenuating circumstances. These offices have been owned by Democrats for decades. And right. so it's not really a surprise. Um, to Inter me. Interesting, though, when you think about it, um, Megan, let me talk, toss this one to you. I, you know, lots of folks I talked to say the D.A. and everything else, it, you know, the A.G., they seem to be the ones in this crime problem. But. Democrats never really get dinged on this in this office, particularly. It's very interesting how this sort of not taking... What do you mean in the AG office? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah, they get every other office is getting dinged on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. The, I, I don't know what to attribute that to, Gene. It's very yeah. interesting. Uh, I was thinking what Tripp was saying about um, the, uh, the Democrats. Alice sent us a note. Uh, when she was uh, down talking to voters and truth or consequences on her way down south. Mm -hmm. Apparently, a voter said to her, after 20 years of Bill Richardson, we honestly don't need any more Bill Richardson in New Mexico. <laughs> yeah. So cute. apparently, he's still on the ballot right. in their minds. So. Rent free, as they say, in, in their heads, <laughs> as they say. Um, any, anybody surprised that Maggie Toulouse-Oliver has cracked over 55%? She's holding at 56%. If she's so controversial, why is everyone voting for her? You know what I'm saying here? I mean, it's... If, if, if she's the centerpiece, I mean, Russell, you have a thought on that by any chance? Well, who is she controversial with? I mean, it seems yeah. like it would be the, she's passionate. The people, yeah, who are passionate are on the rights or on the MAGA folks. They're really mad at her. Yeah, yeah. But they were going to vote for her anyway, but they're really mad at her. But folks on the other side just see her as, as not controversial, not just basically she's filling out her duties of the job that they elected her. And she's very visible. You see her on national cable sure. shows talking about the mm -hmm. vote. She was the president of a of a student of a of a of secretary of state organization. So she's very visible, and yep. and of course she's taken a shot. She's wanted to go for other seats in the past, and there's no there's no secret that she would like to move up to either governor or senate. Mm -hmm. It's something. That, but on the on the issue of crime, I do want to say this. Please. One thing that was puzzled that Republicans didn't hit the attorney general race on, and and any of these, is why aren't New Mexico law enforcement agencies reporting crime better? Ah. We've done some stories that overall there's been a huge drop in the number of police reporting crime to the FBI. So huh. we don't know how good crime, I mean, crime, it could be worse. And I, I thought that was a missed opportunity that they could really hit and say, you are involved and you could tell all your law enforcement agencies to report their crime. Mm -hmm. They're not doing it. Mm -hmm. So, hey, guys out there, it's violent. It's actually more violent than you know. And that was kind of a missed opportunity because mm. you would be critiquing the police, right? And so now for... Yes, you want to support police, but you're also critiquing the police, saying you're not doing your job and reporting the crime. Threading that needle is awfully we, tough. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you this. Um, let's go around the table. Just any final thoughts, any surprises on the night, anything that kind of caught you? Um, let me start with uh, Trip, Trip Jennings, of course. Um, anything, anything catch your eye, Trip? You're uh, executive director of New Mexico in depth, of course. You've been covering this for a while. Seemed to go as standard. It seemed to go as we thought it might. What, but what do you think? Yeah, I mean, the, the race that really has got my eye is just like everybody else, the second congressional district. Yeah. The first and the and the third, they were no-brainers that was going to win. You know, the governor's race, I think, is going to be, that's going to be interesting. But uh, actually, Brian Sanderoff is generally really good with yeah. his polls. Yeah. And showing the eight-point lead to, what is it, two weeks before or a week and a half before, that kind of told me that, that I think the governor has that well in hand. Mm -hmm. But the second, that's... And also, well, let me say this, the early education funding amendment, no surprise there either. Right. Um, but the second, that's, and I think we're going to be waiting for the results for a day or so. 
on that one. Yeah. The, the, the second one. Could very well be. Megan Kamrak, News Director at KUNM. Thank you for all the work KUNM's done leading up to election night as well, that's for sure. The audio side of this is very important, that's for sure. Anything surprise you out of this election from your view? Um, Trip stole my thunder because I was going to say, well, I was, I've covered the, you know, the land grant permanent fund amendment, like way back when I was producing it, came mm -hmm. to me, Gene, mm -hmm. on public square. So it's an issue that's been around forever. Yeah. And um, really it was the um, turnover in, with some of the progressives turning over some seats in Southern New Mexico, specifically um john arthur smith who right. was a conservative democrat mm -hmm. and want, ran the legislative finance committee for many years and had the nickname of dr no <laughs> <laughs> because he was seen as the one blocking that amendment ever going to the voters and so yeah it's kind of amazing to watch i saw the archbishop has already sent out um congratulatory Ah. statement about this because it's uh, seen as an anti-poverty initiative and wow. yeah it's been really interesting to see this finally come to fruition for all the people who've been pushing it for years and I wasn't they had pretty good backing but that was not true for a long long time That's a good point. so it took some shifts in the legislature really mm -hmm. to make that 2011 happen. was when it was introduced 2011 I think was the first wow. yeah so. interesting yeah so it's, it's been a long now. journey yeah absolutely um, and uh, I think the other one was like, well, I don't know. We'll see what happens with the other amendments. Um, I am very interested to see what happens with CD2. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's a real bellwether in a lot of ways mm -hmm. for Latino votes, for candidates, for urban, rural. Um, I don't know. So I'll be fascinated. To see it's what interesting. Happens. No doubt mm -hmm. about that. Patrick Lohman, I know you had your finger in a lot of different. I'm sorry, Ryan, my fault there, Ryan, my fault there. Uh, you've got your finger in a lot of different directions at, over at Source New Mexico. Anything surprise you this cycle? I wouldn't say I've been I'm terribly shocked. Um, you know, like like Trip and Megan said, CD2 was always going to be an interesting one. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's played out, you know, as close as we all thought it would be. Right. I guess, you know, at least looking at the, the returns right now, um, I'm shocked and not shocked that the, the governor's race doesn't seem to be quite as tight as some of the polling suggested. Okay. Um, the reason I say I'm not shocked is because we certainly know from 2016 and on that polling kind of uh, doesn't mean what it once did. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, and, and I guess in that race too, I'm I'm surprised that we didn't see some bigger GOP names come out. Um, you know, we saw DeSantis and Yolkin came out, but right. um, there wasn't a lot of of that national backing from Ron Ketty. I'm a little surprised by that. Mm -hmm. I was a little surprised by Ron Ketty's handling of the Trump endorsement. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tight rope for him to walk, um, but he, he didn't really acknowledge it. And that was a little surprising that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I feel like in his senatorial bid, he kind of wanted some backing from Trump. And, and here he got it and didn't really run with that ball. Interesting point there. I'm glad you brought that up. It's kind of been a little interesting anecdote about the, the whole race. I, I, I want to peel back to your point about uh, uh, not necessarily Trump, but where were all the Republicans for Mr. Ron Ketty? Even the people he defeated in the primary had vowed to get out there for him, and Rebecca Dow did some things, but there really was not a loud, unified Republican voice behind this candidate. And, and Jay Bach actually came out kind of against him on, on a couple of his ads. So. That's right again. Yeah. yeah. Interesting to see. I'd be curious. That DeSantis thing was, was I think, a tell when Mr. DeSantis basically did a presidential 45-minute speech and basically ignored Mark Ronchetti. That was actually kind of, a, kind of an interesting moment there for him, that's for sure. Um, Mar Marisa DeMarco, anything surprise you tonight out of anything that's happened tonight? Um, I guess, you know, in the lead up to election with all of the vitriol and the, the election denier stuff, um, mm -hmm. I am glad that there were not problems at the polls. Yep. Um, and I'm hopeful that the, you know, the concession speeches are easy for folks and that there's kind of the, the gracefulness of, of losing a, a political race, if that is what people are facing and mm -hmm. respecting the will of the voters, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, we hear so much around that. And I think there's sometimes uh, fearfulness uh, or expectation that it's going to go sideways on us, right? And, uh, you know, especially after 2020, I mean, right. I was ready to not, and I hope I don't jinx us, but I was ready for this to kind of 
drag on right, right. for for a while if yep. if people are wanting to contest uh results or if races are too close or maybe there's a bunch of legal challenges or record numbers of um elections related lawsuits in state courts around the country this year right um so we we can see things unfold all sorts of different ways but maybe we'll not come on, just have a regular election where people vote and some people win and some people lose. Right. <laughs> and then we check it out all again next time, right? That's like right. that's, that's now, the way it's now you've to done it. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and we, it, Marisa. And we just go eat our pizza. That's all that's all that matters, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we skip too right. late and we eat our pizza and then we sleep right. a little bit tomorrow. That's yeah. right. That's right. right. Russell yeah. Contreras, anything surprise you tonight from your view? What? One thing that, that I was expecting, and I think mm -hmm. I don't think I've internalized it, I thought the journalists here in New Mexico would crack, and we didn't, right? <laughs> and I thought, that, I thought that Sean Griswold was a, a great example of him just you know, staying courage on the fire and just, just reporting, taking the blows, reporting, taking the criticisms. Mm -hmm. our, our, our Dan Boyd, our, the Dans at the Journal did the same thing. They were attacked on Twitter all the time for yep. endorsements that have nothing to do with them. Mm -hmm. And the, the reporters here just kept kept grinding out, right? And, and what, I, what I thought, I thought Republicans would do a little bit better than because it because the polls suggested and because of the mood of the country. But it just shows that here there's with and we do need a strong Republican Party for democracy. We can't mm -hmm. have a one party rule. Mm -hmm. And right now it, the, the, you brought up the, what was going on with the Ron Kennedy campaign. It really just shows that there still remains a split between the Re Republican Party, between the, the Yates, exactly. Yates camps from yep. the old Governor Martinez camps yep. to the Pierce camp to the Jay mm -hmm. McCluskey camp. Unless those sides can, this is like the state of Massachusetts, where the Republican Party has to be unified in right. order to win big seats. That's right. When it's not, they lose. And this is it. This is case one right here. There's going to be a lot of soul searching. Um, that until they do that, they're not going to have be competitive in this purple state that is leaning blue as long as you don't have a strong Republican Party. Heck, that's a nice way to finish the night. I want to thank the Reporters Roundtable, all the folks you see here. Thank you guys so much, even the ones who had to leave us and go cover Algernon and Ryan and others and Patrick and uh, you're Ryan, you're here, but Patrick had to split. Thank you guys so much. We'll, we'll do more of this Friday night, seven o'clock channel 5.1. We'll have a, another group, uh, political experts to talk about what happened. If there are any races out there still outstanding, perhaps going into the end of the week, I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not, but we never know on CD2. We'll cover that as well. But until then, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. Take care. We'll see you Friday night. Have a good night.